Okay, off we go. So here's where we left off. So we were talking about the chain rule, and there's various different ways to think about it, and uh, lots to say. We won't repeat, of course. Okay, so I want to talk about how to do second derivatives. By the way, you're going to notice this is something that's not really done in the book, uh, significantly anyway. Um, and I think that's an um, unfortunate choice. Uh, it comes up a lot, um, really commonly and in powerful and in important ways. Um, so uh, anyway, here we go. Uh, oh, and by the way, you will notice also that this is on the content syllabus. This is in the column called included material. So again, that, uh, that column indicates stuff that's not in the book, but that is fair game for the course uh, as, as this is. Okay, so um, ultimately this is uh, a bit of advice that I think is extremely helpful in making all this stuff work. Uh, and why this is such helpful advice will reveal itself, I think, better in the example. So let me just go ahead and get started on the example. Okay, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> here we go. Let's see. Where's my... There it is. Okay, so uh, we have uh, z is a function of x and y, and of course I need to be able to compute partials, and I don't want to have to worry about regularity issues, so I'm going to assume this is a C2 function. And uh, that said... With z being a function of x and y, keep in mind x and y are functions of r and theta in the standard way, you know, x and r cosine theta, y is r sine theta, etc. Okay, so altogether, viewing x and y as functions of r and theta, viewing z as a function of x and y, we've got ourselves a composition, and we can talk about uh, you know, how to use the chain rule to compute partial derivatives. Now, here's the thing. Um, I want to compute a second derivative. Second derivative of z with respect to r. And that's something we just have not talked about previously. Now, obviously, the first step in taking a second derivative is to take a first derivative. Now, that's no big, right? This is, I mean, yawn, uh, first path through the first intermediate variable gives me the first term. Second path through the second intermediate variable gives me the second term. Nothing to it. Uh, we did a lot of that last time. And then uh, the rewrite that I have that follows is, is really just kind of uh, some trivialities. Uh, this right here, you'll notice, that's just notation. That's just an alternative notation for the partial of z with respect to x. Uh, we don't use it much before this, but it's going to be really handy coming up in a moment, and uh, likewise uh, right here. Um, the other things are to just recall that we have explicit formulas uh, for how x and y are functions of r and theta. There's nothing ambiguous about that, right? This f thing that tells you about how z depends on x and y, that we're leaving open. Uh, <clears throat> that could be a lot of different things. Who knows? We can't assume anything there. But uh, how x and y are functions of r and theta, that's in the book, right? And very standard. You can just straight up compute these partials. And again, nothing to it. Yes? Yeah, that's polar coordinates. So if you look back to the definition of polar coordinates, we have these polar coordinate conversion formulas, and x is r cosine theta. Is, it, is that cool? Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, yeah. So here's our first uh, color choices. Here's our first partial derivative, and now I'm going to make the innocent observation that if I take the first partial, and then if I take <laughs> if I take the r partial of that r partial, then that will give me the second partial. Now exactly how to do that, and where are the details, yeah, 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 we're going to flesh that all out, right? But so for the moment, innocent observation, I just need to take another r partial. And we'll get, uh, by the way, uh, let's uh, momentarily pay no attention to the this over here for the moment. Let's just think about how I would compute the R partial of this R partial, which, by the way, again, I just computed, and it's just all of this business right here. So I need to compute this. And first innocent observation I want to make, and you'll get lucky sometimes. Uh, this is one of those times. Um, cosine theta, claim is a constant. 
And the reason I know cosine theta is a constant, it goes back to definitions of what do I mean by taking a partial derivative. And if I'm taking a partial of z with respect to r, that means I'm viewing z as a composition. I'm going to let r be my variable. And, well, that means theta is a constant. And that means cosine theta is a constant, and sine theta is a constant, all of that is just constant. Again, that's how partial derivatives are defined. Yes? Is this limiting with a Zx with Zx? Yeah, this is just, Zx is just an alternative notation for the partial of Z oh, with respect to X. Yeah, 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 no worries. Okay. All right, so now good news, constants, just factor right out, right? So this, uh, mm -hmm. Let me clean up the mess. Uh, being that that's a constant, I can just pull it out uh, outside of the derivative like so. Okay, so these little matters aside, now here's what I've really got to worry about. And this is going to be subtle. How am I going to compute the partial with respect to r of zx? Let me show you the wrong answer first. Right? It's very tempting, alluring and nonsense. Okay? The temptation is to say, oh, okay, well, I'm taking a, first an x partial and then an r partial, so why can't I call this, question mark, this is absolute nonsense. Please don't, you know, uh, write this down without being prepared to cross it out and scratch it out because this is absolute nonsense garbage uh, partial with respect to r, right? So zx r, right? We had the zx, and then apparently I'm supposed to take the r partial of that. What's wrong with that? Well, <laughs> this doesn't satisfy the rules that we've discussed previously. Um, I can't view z. Whoops. Eh, highlighter mode. I cannot view z simultaneously as being functions of well all of the variables, including both x and r, right? Z is not a function of four variables. Um, I can view z as being a function of x and y. Right? That's kind of the second function in the composition. Um, I can talk about the composition itself in which z is a function of r and theta. True. But I can't make any sense out of this. After all, if you were to take the partial with respect to r, that would require holding x, y, and theta constant. And you can't change r and fix x. This doesn't make any sense. It's just garbage nonsense. So, so again, please do not make the mistake of uh, trying to, you know, don't write it like that. That is nonsense. It does not mean anything. Um, you, the garbage, absolute garbage. Okay, so that's what we're not going to do. Okay, so what to do then? And uh, what we're going to do is come back up here to the top of the page where I made this observation where I said it would make sense later. Um, and that is, uh, if, um, if z is a function of x and y, indicated thusly, okay, well then, so are its partials. zx and zy are also functions of x and y. And we're just going to indicate so. Zx, function of x and y. Put that on the diagram. And Zy, also function of x and y. And put that on the diagram. I think this is immensely helpful. Uh, you'll see how it's helpful uh, momentarily. But that's all this hint means uh, up there. This, uh, this sort of uh, summary uh, advice up there it means add Zx and Zy in the appropriate places on your diagram. And now look how nicely everything comes out. We had this mystery of how to make sense of the partial with respect to R of Zx. And now Zx, all right, there it is. And I want to take the partial with respect to R. Well, there's R, so go ahead. Chain rule, it's right there on the right there on the diagram. We've got two paths. There's the x path through the x intermediate variable that gives us an x term. 
And we've got the y path through the y intermediate variable that gives us the y term. And this mystery of like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How are we going to make sense? Is this a thing? Can you really even write that down? Oh, what is going on? And then it's just, boom, chain rule. And it all comes out of adding these to the diagram. So I think that's a uh, <laughs> very, very <clears throat> satisfying and uh, a convenient way to make sense out of this. And uh, it gives us what we really need. And keep in mind, our goal here was to compute the partial of ZX with respect to R. So that's what this is. And then please do be careful. It's so, especially when you have so many variables and terms and every, expressions are huge. It's easy to lose track of what you've got. So please do be, be methodical about how you write these things down. I know it seems tedious and unmathematical to worry about layout, right? But you'd be surprised how much of a difference it makes when you're trying to get right answers, right? When you're trying to show that you have functional proficiency with tools, um, being able to avoid oops is, is very, very valuable. So, uh, so in particular, don't forget about the cosine theta. Real easy to forget because, uh, you know, you've written down so much to this point and it's easy to kind of accidentally sort of move over a little too quickly and forget something. Okay, uh, same basic idea allows you to see what the partial of ZY with respect to R is. Because ZY, okay, there it is. Uh, with respect to R, there it is. Again, we have two paths. There's the X path through the X variable giving us the X term. And there's the Y path through the Y intermediate variable giving us the Y term. Same basic deal. Uh, and again, that's computed that partial for us. And don't, ah, color. Don't forget to carry over your sine theta. So that's the meat of it right there. Everything else is all downhill. Now, uh, there are little detailed devils, as there often are in math, uh, things you got to sort of think through. Uh, so again, this, I can just re-notate uh, partial of ZX with respect to X. There's no compositions there. There's no... Um, is that really a thing? Concerns there. Z is directly a function of x and y. This just says take the second partial. No big deal. So uh, some notational changes that we make on that basis, uh, like so. Uh, and then again, don't forget x and y are explicit functions of r and theta. And so all of this is just straight up. Um, you know, easy partial derivatives, and of course, don't forget your constants that come along for the ride. Uh, and then it's just a matter of uh, kind of algebraic manipulations to turn that into this, uh, and uh, this is the sort of the, the, the most compact and convenient final form. So uh, again, little micro details, okay? You got to do the micro details. You can't spike the football on the two-yard line, right? Uh, but uh, the meat of the matter, uh, the uh, important part, the you know the the nugget uh, that makes all of this work is this right here, where we turn that, for example, into this by way of uh, I'm just going to say playing the usual game on that diagram. Everybody on board? Okay, that's the big idea. Uh, let me show you an example of how this is useful. Um, <clears throat> this is a, by the way, a really big deal in physics. And physics is a really big deal in engineering. A lot of y'all are engineering majors, I know. So uh, anyway, the following is uh, a very powerful, very sophisticated idea that will be very helpful uh, in, your, in your futures. Um, so uh, first, a, a quick little bit of context. There's this thing called the Laplacian operator. Um, that is uh, written like so. It's the sum of the rectangular second partials, the uh, unmixed rectangular second partials. And why this is cool is a uh, long conversation about physics. And uh, there's some uh, powerful, wonderful arguments in there with 
cool application. I mean, big applications. If you want to understand how waves move, kind of a big deal. Uh, it's um, you're going to have to write this down. It's a major part of understanding the wave equation. If you want to understand how heat flows, again, kind of a big deal, right? Well, the heat equation is powerfully influenced by uh, this operator, the Laplacian operator. If you want to understand how electro... I mean, these are really central physics questions, right? And they all make uh, uh, major use of the Laplacian operator. So this is huge. Um, so, okay, that said, this Laplacian operator, I claim you can rewrite it in spherical coordinates and that it turns out to be this. And you may be thinking to yourself, okay, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. I'll stick with this one. <laughs> right? Okay, that's certainly my thought when I first saw these two options. I was like, um, yeah, I don't see how this is helping. Right? It seems like we're making things a lot worse. Before I try to persuade you that this is a major win, which it is, um, let me just describe where it comes from. It comes from the material on the previous page where we, talk, we talked about how to compute second partials um, <clears throat> uh, uh, with, you know, uh, in the context of the chain rule. And the way you would prove that these, are e that these are equal to each other, a lot of people think you would try to figure out how to do that, and that actually doesn't work anywhere near as well. And it's much easier to do this. And so what you're going to do is you're going to look at each part of this equation. For example, second partial with respect to theta. Well, there's f and there's theta. And you're going to compute this second partial, thinking about second partials just like we did on the previous page. And the previous page was polar instead of spherical. A lot of different details. And yeah, I will confess, this one gets quite a bit hairier than the one on the previous page. Uh, it's no accident that I picked the relatively easy one right, to write down. But the only thing that's really different is that there are more terms and there's more algebra. Conceptually, it's the exact same idea. Right? So you would compute that, and then you would likewise just compute all the different individual pieces of this, and when you put them all together, what you will find is that indeed this monstrosity here simplifies exactly to the rectangular Laplacian. Okay, so now um, I, uh, this is where very often I would say, uh, yeah, this would be a nice exercise for you all to do. I'm going to conspicuously not say that here. There's a lot. <laughs> and if you really want to, I guess you could. Um, it is, a, it is whew, it's a lot of work. Right? So I don't particularly recommend that you actually crank that out, um, but uh, for your consideration. Okay, so again, back to the who cares? Like, how does this make my life easier? Um, so let's do. Let's talk a little bit of physics. Um, potential energy, electric potential, gravitational potential, whatever. Um, when you have uh, inverse square uh, forces, satisfies this equation right here. <coughs> the Laplacian is equal to zero. So if you want to understand uh, these, um, these potentials, like if you want to understand uh, what I'm going to call F, it's going to be one of these potentials, uh, then uh, what you're going to have to do is figure out how to compute its Laplacian and confirm that that Laplacian indeed is zero. If you want to claim that you have a valid solution, that's what you're going to have to do. All right, and I'm going to just show you in advance what the right answer is. Uh, the right answer in the case of a, either a point mass or a point charge, the right answer is that the Laplacian, excuse me, the, uh, the, the potential is uh, uh, 1 over rho, or constant over rho. Constant, doesn't really matter. Um, and, of course, now uh, you can rewrite that in rectangular coordinates like this. Take your pick. Okay, so apparently what we need to do is compute the Laplacian, which I could do in rectangular coordinates or which I could do in spherical coordinates, um, of these functions f, which I can think of in rectangular coordinates or which I can think of in spherical coordinates, 
and I've got to compute. One or the other of these two things, option one or option two, you choose, right, which one of these you want to compute. Um, and uh, you better get zero. Okay, you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, again, sticking with the rectangular. Thank you. This looks like a nightmare, doesn't it? Okay, this one's easy. This one, we're going to do this one in our head. I'm going to barely have to write anything down. This one's so falling down simple. It's just almost a joke. This one up here is tedious effort. <laughs> Believe it or not. Um, so now a quick wave of the hands at the option one. Uh, you, you do see that there's a square root in the denominator. And we're going to be taking not just one partial. We're going to be taking a second partial. And we're going to have six derivatives to deal with, all of which use the quotient rule and the power rule with fractions and the chain rule. And it's unwieldy. And it, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it's doable. But if, you know, if you're compact and efficient about it, you can probably keep it down to a densely written page. Or if you like big lettering and uh, to flesh things out completely, it's uh, page or two. Now let's do the easy one. Super easy. Let's look at how this first term, how does that apply to that expression? Well, the very first thing that happens, I need to take a theta partial of something that has no thetas in it. This whole thing is zero. Bam. Zero. Bye-bye. Yeah? Everybody see that? We're taking a, th right here in front of us, we're taking a theta partial of something that has no thetas in it. Zero. Gotta love it. Okay, next. Fine. Uh, <clears throat> so that's gone. Uh, let me go ahead and just leave all that crossed out. Now we're going to take, ooh, this one's scary looking. We're going to take that and apply it to here. And you will notice the very first thing to happen is we're taking a fee partial of something that has no fees in it. And again, gone. That's all zero at a glance. I don't have to use quotient rule and deal with fractions and chain rule and square roots and oh my gosh. No, just boop, gone, zero. Right? I hope everybody's starting to see the appeal of the spherical Laplacian. Very handy. Um, okay, last one. Now we are going to have to do a little bit of work for this last one. Uh, you'll notice the first thing that we do to uh, the row term. I'm going to take the row partial of constant over row. That is not zero. That's going to be uh, some constant. Let's not worry, but the, the constants are not going to be our problem. Some constant over row squared. Right. So if that's a constant over row squared, and if I multiply it by row squared, that means that this thing right here will be a constant. And what is the derivative with respect to, I don't even care what, the derivative of a constant is zero. So again, all of that's gone. Indeed, this is equal to zero. Check. We have confirmed that we have a valid potential in Laplace's equation. And again, kind of eyeball glance. Everybody happy? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> you do enough um, E and M, or uh, you know, study gravitational fields and stuff like that, uh, and you will become a subscriber to the idea of the spherical Laplacian. Where does the spherical Laplacian come from? Well, the spherical Laplacian comes from I mean, this. Th ooh, this thing right here comes from this idea of being able to take second partials in the with, you know, uh, with of compositions. So all of this stuff back here is ultimately how that all worked. Okay. okay. All right. So I like that example. Okay. On to the next thing. So um, <clears throat> let's see here. I'm going to have to switch over now to a different screen <coughs> and pretty soon. Um, let me remind you all about the partial derivative. Oh, yeah. Question. So when dealing with different coordinate system, your advice yeah. is always like, hey, if we're dealing with uh, you know, spherical, swap to spherical using the techniques shown, or swap to cylindrical or whatever else you're using. Uh, I mean, 
You always want to think craftily and strategically about what's going to be the most convenient coordinate system. Just because something comes to you in spherical doesn't mean spherical is going to be the best coordinate system. But if uh, if if things are looking nice in spherical coordinates, then yeah, do it in spherical coordinates. And and certainly don't reflexively cling to the idea of rectangular coordinates as being the right way to do things and everything else is some sort of weirdo nonsense for people who just like to be ornery. It, that, no, that's wrong. Right? Rectangular is a coordinate system. It has its moments, but the world is full of circles. The world is full of spheres and balls and stuff like that. And spherical coordinates is very, very natural. Yeah. Does it make sense? So it, again, you have to kind of let the context be your guide. Okay, so uh, section 2.6, uh, we're going to start off talking about partial derivatives. And um, the first set of things I have written down here is really just kind of reminders of stuff we already know about partial derivatives. Partial derivatives are slopes of graphs. <coughs> yeah, I mean, as you move in the direction of the coordinate that you're taking the partial with respect to, notice I'm writing that uh, direction by way of a unit vector pointing in that direction, as opposed to phrasing it in terms of the variable, the coordinate that I'm taking the partial with respect to. That's going to be an important distinction in a couple of minutes, but it means the same thing here. Um, partial derivatives are also, um, let me do it like this, partial derivatives are also multiplicative factors. This is one of my favorite points of view about derivatives in general. Derivatives are factors very often. Right? What you multiply by an input change, get an output change. And again, uh, and let's see, let me redo this. Factors, multiplicative factors, as you move in the direction of that unit vector. Okay, old news. Um, if you look back to the definition of partial derivative. Now this is a rewrite, and I think this is a nice exercise. Y'all can persuade yourselves of this, but this formula right here, in fact, is just an algebraic way of saying what we, you know, described with a, you know, kind of, uh, you know, verbiage describing a process of how to compute partial derivatives. Um, a plus T E I, well keep in mind E I is all zeros, except for a one in one of the coordinates. And so this is a, just a fancy way of saying I want all the coordinates to stay constant except for one, which will be changing. And then we take the derivative with respect to t, which says I'm taking the derivative, you know, how fast is f changing as that one variable increases. So uh, you can uh, write down the algebra if you like, uh, but you want to persuade yourself that in fact this is just a rewrite of the definition. Again, in terms of a vector. No reference here to coordinates. Right? Yes? I mean, the unit vector is like one of the axes. Standard basis vectors. Okay. Standard basis vectors. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's got to be a standard basis vector because we're talking about a partial with respect to you know one of these variables, which means all the other variables have to be constant. Yeah, right. Um, what does it mean there to Oh, uh, yeah, that's just the, the detail. If you think about it, if, if I want to talk about how the function's changing when I'm at this point, I'm only at that point when that t is equal to zero. It's only at that instant, right? The purpose of saying a plus t e is not because I want to actually, you know, like here's the point a, it's not because I actually want to talk about points over there. It's just I need that as a way of describing how I'm moving while I'm at the point a. And t equals zero is the moment where I'm at the point A. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then another <laughs> little quickie observation, and this is an easy one. You can just uh, take the definition of the gradient and do this dot product explicitly, and you will find that you get that partial derivative. So again, that's uh, none of this is uh, really new. I, mean, I guess you could say some of this is a uh, different point of view on stuff we already knew. But none of this is actually new stuff. <coughs> okay. All right. So uh, I have to emphasize all of this is as you move in, uh, in the direction of a particular standard basis vector. And again, it has to be a standard basis vector because it's standard basis vectors that point in the direction of certain coordinate axes. 
Okay. Now here's where I have to uh, uh, switch uh, gears a little bit. Uh, this goes back to the very beginning of chapter two. This is like the second page of the lecture notes for for chapter two. You remember we talked about this terminology of uh, you know real valued, vector valued uh, versus. Uh, let me get out of that mode uh, versus uh, you know. Uh, Single variable, multivariable, etc. So I want to complain about this notation a little bit. Now this uh, this uh, terminology, excuse me, uh, this terminology is in the title of our course. <laughs> it's unfortunate, uh, and it's it's kind of misleading. Um, this suggests that the variables, that the coordinates are ultimately kind of what we ought to be concerned about. And I would like to propose that that's really pretty wrong. Um, the coordinates, the variables, um, the coordinates of what you might call the point that you put into the function are ultimately not the thing that we're actually interested in. What we're actually interested in is the point itself. The point itself is what we are putting into the function. Coordinates are just a convenient indexing tool. It's a label that's handy for our purposes, right? But it's just a label that you put on the actual thing that we're interested in. Right? And so here is a uh, picture. Oh, where did I put it? Oh, I guess I put it down here. Yeah. So um, I've made up uh, a uh, random uh, sort of uh, picture here of, uh, of some function. You'll notice I've drawn a bunch of level sets. So let's imagine that the function's getting larger as we sort of go up. So this is on the side of a mountain or something like that. Okay, Okay. so um, we've got a picture here of, um, uh, in a sense, you know, uh, some function. Let's talk about the partial derivative, right? So if I wanted to say how fast is the function changing as I go in the E1 direction, um, how would I sort of get my hands on that? Very first question is, what is the E1 direction here? Which direction is the, does the x-axis point on this picture? You notice I deliberately kind of turned it to the side a little bit because I wanted you to be thinking, oh, well, I don't know. It depends. Uh, are we going parallel to the page or are we going parallel to the paper map that seems to have been laid out at an angle or uh, it's really not clear. Which direction should be the x-axis? And the point I'm trying to get at here is, yeah, it's arbitrary. It's totally arbitrary. Basically, I'm going to say kind of random almost, if you really think about it. right? So how do we keep track of where we are in planet Earth? Well, I, I mean, the Earth is rotating, and that defines this thing called the North Pole, and kind of arbitrarily, Someone decided forever ago that, well, let's just think about that North Pole. Now, it'll kind of be our foot in the door in defining a rectangular coordinate system for, for how to get around on planet Earth. It's arbitrary. It's completely made up. There's nothing intrinsically natural about that. Okay, so now uh, that said, okay, let's go ahead and make a choice. Let me let me just say I'm going to decide that that's the x-axis and that's the y-axis, and then I could write out this altitude function in terms of these variables, the x variable and the y variable, and I could have some formula written in terms of those variables. But let's get right down to the point here. Um, that's just the label. What I actually care about is what is the altitude at particular points. The points are the objects of interest. The coordinates and the axes are arbitrary, made-up conveniences. They're not in charge. They're not the thing, right? They're just a, they come along for the ride. Does that make sense to everybody? So uh, here's the, the the reason I'm getting at this point. The reason I'm getting at this point is if I were to say, hey, uh, certain mathematical facts are true as you go in the direction of these axes, but only if you go in the directions of these axes. Oh, you mean those arbitrary axes that you just, for no particular reason, happen to draw in a particular way? And if someone comes along and says, well, I'm interested in what's happening as I go in 
that direction. Just a perfectly good, no, different unit vector. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. No, you can't use that. No, that that uh, that's uh, that's not a standard basis vector. So forget about it. We don't know at all what's going on in that direction. And then the response could be, well, yeah, but look, I mean. I could have called that the x-axis and that the y-axis, and now my vector is a unit vector, excuse me, is a standard basis vector, and yours are all diagonally and nonsensical and not standard basis vectors. You know what I mean? So what is a standard basis vector is basically arbitrary. And uh, so with that in mind, let's come back here and revisit uh, this thing, uh, the only thing that uh, restricts me from saying, look, all of these ideas, uh, these are all tied together, and uh, let's see, you know, <laughs> all of these, you know, the thing that computes the slope of the graph, the thing that is the multiplicative factor, the thing that I can write with this formula or that formula, the only thing that restricts me in which unit vectors I'm allowed to say this about is this arbitrary question of how I set up my axes, which again, kind of meaningless and arbitrary and not really intrinsic to the thing. So, yeah, so set up your axes however you like. And as previously discussed, you can do this with any unit vector. Because any unit vector could have been a standard basis vector. So here, here we go. I'm going to take all the same ideas from the previous page and say, look, whatever unit vector you have, you can write down this expression using that. Could have, would have, should have been a standard basis vector, but isn't. Uh, uh, you can write down that. Again, just as well could have been a standard basis vector. And you can say that that will give you the slope of the graph, again, as you move in the direction of that vector. And it's the multiplicative factor. Okay, well again, as you move in that direction. So, <clears throat> these things all relate to each other. These things are all the same. Because every unit vector, turn your head to the side appropriately, right? Every unit vector is a standard basis vector. If you choose your axes right. Now, I can't call this a partial derivative. Because partial derivative, yeah, I mean, the, the term is, mm -hmm, this term, partial derivative, and let me get rid of all the mess here. The term partial derivative is basically kind of attached to the idea of a coordinate. And so it's this term is subservient to this arbitrary choice of how you set up your axes. Okay, so we can't use that term. Fine, I <coughs> Who cares? It's just a term. So we just have to make up a different term. And since here we can't talk about partial derivatives, we can't talk about variables, we'll just make up a new term. And here it is. It's called a directional derivative. It's, a, it's the same idea as a partial derivative conceptually. It's all of these things that I have circled on the page. It's a dot product with the gradient. It's a parametrized derivative of the function with respect to t. It's the slope of the graph. It's the multiplicative factor. It's all those things. Just like partials were, I just can't call it a partial. Everybody got me? Everybody good? It's a little bit of a mind stretch. Right? It seems like I'm cheating or pulling a fast one or something. This is all fine. Um, it is, by the way, important that it remain a unit vector. Uh, it's got to be a unit vector because uh, <clears throat> if I want to be able to draw all these conclusions, uh, because after all, um, if you change the scale of the vector, it's like you're changing the scale of the picture, right? And um, if you if you measure, you know, altitude as a function of position, if you measure those positions in miles. That's one thing, but if you measure it in yards, it's very different. You're going to get some very different formula. All the numbers are going to change. Everything's different. So uh, I can only do this uh, fast one for unit vectors. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we'll see some examples in a minute. But while, Oh, yeah, question. Um, what is ds here? Is it like position? 
Um, so uh, yeah, so DS is yeah, that's kind of what I was going to get to. Yeah, yeah. So DS is a measurement of how far we go in a given direction. So up here, you know, we talked about how far we go in a given direction um, by the differential of the variable defining that direction. But since we don't have a variable here to, with which to do such a thing, I have to make up sort of my own new notation. But so the idea is this says how far are you going in the direction of your unit vector? Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Okay, so just a quick observation and we've already made the observation slope of the graph and you know here's the there's the tangent line uh, and so the slope of the tangent line, which is talking about that slope right there, the usual way. Uh, but as we go in the direction, not in the direction of the x-axis, not in the direction of the y-axis, but in the direction of our new arbitrary unit vector v, which could be pointing any direction. All right, so uh, also, let's while we're here, let's make the observation. This is just an algebraic observation. Um, if you want to think about what you multiply by either displacement or speed in the domain to get displacement or speed in the target, I appeal to your sense of notation. This is just a notational appeal. I'm, I'm about to make something up here. But what would I multiply? How, how would I like to denote the thing I multiply by ds to get df? Or the thing I multiply by dsdt to get dfdt? It's awfully tempting to want to call it this so that I can, you know, okay, and again, cringe, uh, cancel. You can't really do that. That's not a thing, right? But it's that in this case, in fact, victimless crime. This is perfectly fine. It gives us perfectly reasonable answers uh, and interpretations. And so this notation right here, DFDS, is an all is an alternative notation for how we write this multiplicative factor that we multiply. And keeping in mind that all of this is a reference to the directional derivative. It's an alternative notation for directional derivatives. Directional derivatives you can write as dfds. Now there's an important distinction to be made here. We want to distinguish between the two different kinds of derivatives of f that we can do. Up here you're going to notice I'm taking the derivative of f with respect to t. Rate of change of the function with respect to time. If I start running up that mountain really fast, and I want to know how many feet of altitude am I gaining per unit time, right? Because that's going to be my bragging point. I'm running fast. I'm gaining altitude fast. You get onto your treadmill, it tells you how many feet per minute that you're climbing per unit time, right? On the other hand, now here we're also talking about DFDS. And the thing about DFDS is it's got nothing to do with time. DFDS says how, how much does the mountain, how much do you gain in altitude on the mountain per distance that you travel along the map? This is about the mountain. It's not about you. It's not about how fast you're running. It, it, this, this, you're not even there necessarily, right? You can talk about DFDS just of the mountain itself. So these are different kinds of derivatives, right? Um, uh, DFDT with respect to time, DFDS with respect to distance. And they happen to be the same, right? Again, as noted here, they happen to be the same uh, when you have a unit vector. Okay, so a couple examples. These are uh, nice little quick examples. Um, reasonable question you might ask. Um, <clears throat> we got some function. We want to talk about the graph. Again, graph. Okay, not level sets. Right, graph. So a graph of this function is going to be some sort of a shape. By the way, we all remember that's a paraboloid. Make sure you're good with that. Um, and we want to entertain this idea of being at a certain point A. 
and moving in the direction indicated by the vector v, and just to be emphatic, uh, vectors don't have locations. Vectors only have direction and magnitude. Uh, so I'm going to draw it over here uh, just because I can, and then, yeah, but for mm, intuition purposes, yes, of course. That's describing how we are moving from this point, so I'm going to draw it with its tail at that point for kind of convenience. But remember, vectors do not have locations. Okay, so at a certain point, moving in a certain direction, and the question asks me for slope of the graph. Uh, the very first thing I'm going to do then is say, oh, slope of the graph? Oh, yeah, slope of the graph. Uh, that's one of my interpretations of directional derivative. Slope of the graph is a directional derivative, which, by the way, I notice I can compute with this very convenient little handy-dandy formula. So the question asks me to compute slope of the graph. I'm going to write that down, and then this... And I'm going to plug and chug. And so uh, here we go. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, slope of the graph, directional derivative. Write that down. Compute the uh, gradient. Um, you know, you got to take the partial derivatives of the function, uh, plug in the appropriate point, etc. Now here's the little sticky wicket. A lot of students get this wrong. The vector that we were given to define our direction is not a unit vector. Very importantly, you come back here, you want to make this connection, you want to claim that directional derivatives, super easy to compute directional derivatives, you want that to be the slope of a graph, better be a unit vector. We were given not a unit vector. So, uh, <clears throat> no sweat, all you got to do is take the vector that you were given and unitize it. So the unit vector that points in that same direction, well, we just take V divided by its own magnitude. U, V over 5, is a unit vector. So you'll notice here that when I said directional derivative, I have to use the unit vector pointing in the direction of U. <coughs> and it is likewise the <coughs> unit vector that I dot with the gradient. And you can see that it is the unit vector right there. That it, don't forget that divided by 5, right? you got to make sure to uh, do that. Do not just dot it with 3 comma 4. Everybody on board? Compute, compute, details. You all can do the rest of that. Um, one other uh, thing, though, just a conceptual thing I want to point out. This is, again, easily misunderstood. You don't want to conflate... Uh, uh, let's see here, do it like this. Uh, this phrasing in the direction of with this phrasing toward the point. These are importantly different things. Uh, this says vector, not point. Vectors don't have a location. Vectors just point in certain directions. Right, and so when I say the direction of that vector, well, whatever that vector is, it's got a direction, and uh, that's what that direction is. That's the direction that we're talking about, the direction that those arrows point. That's the direction. If we say toward the point, it's tempting to say, okay, well, the point 3, 4, well, the point 3, 4 would be, uh, I don't know, about like that, I guess. There's 3, 4, let's say. And, uh, well, let's see here. I'm at the point 3, 1. So I'm here. Am I going uh, toward the point? Am I going that way? Right? Nope. Wrong direction. Because you're interpreting what was given as a vector instead as being a point which it's not. Right, so you do have to make sure to uh, interpret carefully, think about the phrasing, and interpret uh, uh, carefully accordingly. By the way, on an exam, if you find yourself not sure about the phrasing, what did what did the ex what did Bray mean by however he phrased a particular question right, on the test? Come up and ask me. All right, perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine to ask for a clarification on what the question is asking. 
And if it is, in fact, phrased in a way that is ambiguous, then you'll have my apology and my clarification. On the other hand, just keep in mind, it might be that it is, in fact, perfectly unambiguous as phrased, and I might just tell you, well, you just have to interpret this as it's written and it is explicit. So anyway, one way or the other, feel free to ask. Okay. So let's see here. By the way, where am I on? Oh, are we out of time? We are out of time. Okay, so we will draw the line right there and pick up here on Wednesday. Okay, see you all later. Have a good one.